Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds this, uh, this Thursday morning. I'm Abba Kadiwada. I'm one of the internal medicine um, chief residents here this academic year. Um, welcome to the FLANS professorship lectureship in general, um, or specifically this morning. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome two speakers this morning. I'll start off by introducing Dr. Michael Holtzman, who is the director of the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. Take it away, Dr. Holtzman. Thank you, Abba. Good morning to everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the 44th, uh, would have been the 45th, but we had a pickup along the way. So this is the 44th I, Jerome Flance Lecture. And first, just to keep the legend alive, I'll briefly explain how this lectureship came to be and give some perspective for the amazing Dr. Flance and then introduce this year's speaker. So my first slide that's up already uh, shows Jerry I think that's up already, shows Jerry alongside a timeline um, in what I call Fountain of Youth Flance years for his many accomplishments, uh, beginning with his graduation from medical school here in 1935. He then practiced pulmonary medicine at this hospital for some 60 years, nearly until he passed away in 2010 at the age of 98. He would say that being a physician was his vocation and his avocation. So that's where he put much of his time. Along the way, his friends endowed the Flance Lecture in 1976 in honor of his reaching retirement age of 65. And in response, Jerry became even more committed, if that was possible, and went on to make his most remarkable contributions in community service, uh, marked here in purple, and fundraising, marked symbolically here in green, um, and collecting award after award, marked in blue. His achievements seeded the growth of the pulmonary division, but he was also one of the most vigorous supporters the entire university has ever had, along with his childhood friend that some of you know well, uh, named Edith Wolf. He had two primary goals to support Washington University and to steer the school to serve the underserved. He started by developing clinics for the healthcare of individuals but he moved on to reviving whole neighborhoods for the health care of the community when he realized that good health care also meant having a good job and a good place to live. And hopefully uh, on the second slide, that transition is captured uh, here. With the first shot taken in 1953, showing Jerry in his role as the founding director of the home care program here at the school. And the second shot, fast forward now 50 years, showing Jerry now the Assistant Dean for Community Development, where he's celebrating an equally successful project for the redevelopment of the Forest Park Southeast community, including as shown here, the opening of the Adams School for the neighborhood's children. His approach uh, really in private and public roles maintained a fearless commitment uh, to improve the lives of others that were less fortunate and my view in some is that this lecture has become an important legacy to recall his example, probably just as topical today as ever, uh, but at least once every year and to try and follow his example for another 98 years or so. So I also know that Jerry would have been particularly pleased uh, that this year's Flance Lectureship was awarded to Dr. Bonnie Ramsey, who is a terrific trailblazer in her own right. In picking Dr. Ramsey, we were aiming for a renowned physician scientist who is committed to understanding problems in clinical medicine. And Dr. Ramsey has done just that in her work on cystic fibrosis at the other Washington in Seattle, where she now holds a series of key leadership roles. Most especially to me, she was a pioneer in creating and running the CF Foundation Therapeutics Development Network in what turned out to be one of the great and quite rare success stories of drug development in pulmonary medicine and really medicine in general. I'm really extremely pleased to introduce Dr. Ramsey as this year's Flance Lecturer to talk about the journey from bench to bedside in CF. Dr. Ramsey.
Can you see my slides? Can you hear me? Oh, good. But there is an echo at the moment. Well, my slides have come up on. Uh, can you see my slides? Hello? Yep. Your slides are displayed. They are displayed currently. But are, are they yours, Ava, or did mine come up? Sorry, I'm, I'm currently sharing them. Were you able to log on your computer? Uh, yeah, but I don't know whether it's sharing or not. Why don't I just go with your slide? That sounds good, yeah. Okay, let me. Let me, let me. Okay, sorry about this. We're technical typically. Can you hear me now? Sounds great, the echo's gone. Okay, all right, well, I'll go ahead and get get started. Um, and thank you, I, I am delighted uh, to have been invited as the Florence uh, visiting professor of, from uh, Seattle to St. Louis. And I'm sorry, I can't be there in, in person, uh, but as you know, it's been an interesting year. So, um, and un unfortunately, um, Ava is going to have to afford my slides for me because uh, we had some technical difficulties. So I apologize if I keep saying next. Uh, but anyway, um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, a remarkable international effort. Uh, Dr. Holtzman mentioned it between clinicians, researchers, patients, and families. Uh, to translate basic science knowledge into approved drugs that truly have changed the lives of patients with CF. Um, as the director of the CFTDN, I was really able to be the eyewitness to all the challenges and joys of this uh, remarkable journey from bench to bedside. Uh, next. Uh, here are my financial disclosures. Uh, next. So cystic fibrosis is a life-shortening autosomal recessive uh, disease. Um, its prevalence in the U.S., uh, the roughly 30,000 patients, this is for the disease, this doesn't, not all uh, mutations. Um, and worldwide, we think it's about 70,000, but that may be an underestimate that because it's less than 200,000 individuals in the US, it gives it rare disease status, which is important in uh, drug development. And if you look at the uh, figure, this is from the 2019 CF registry, which is the most recent registry that's available. Um, the median age at death is 32 years, survival is 48 years. Uh, you'll see that there is a, um, a dotted line to the left, that was from 1989, and today is in a yellow. And so there's really been an improvement of almost 15 years over this time period. But an important point is that it doesn't account for these new modulators that I'm going to be talking about. So I think we're going to see a, another mark jump in survival. Next slide. And since I, I am talking to an adult medicine uh, population, though I am myself a pediatric pulmonologist, um, CF is now a predominantly adult disease. And I think we're gonna continue to see that this is a, an adult population uh, that is going to be in adult pulmonary clinics for many, many years. Next. So what is CF? Uh, the defective CFDR protein uh, is the underlying cause of, of the illness. Um, CF is caused by mutations in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator gene, or CFTR as it's referred. And CFTR encodes for a, a CFTR channel, which sits in the apical membrane of many epithelial cells and functions as a salt channel. Um, it is regulated by both uh, uh, cyclic AMP dependent phosphorylation and also internal ATP. Next. Uh, not surprisingly, because it uh, impacts multiple organs, uh, it is a multi organ disease and um, 
um, there are abnormalities in the upper airway, sinus disease, nasal polyps, pancreatic insufficiency, uh, CF-related liver disease, and other digestive problems, high salt chloride in sweat, and uh, next slide. Uh, for purposes of this study, it would be a lot of focus on uh, chronic lung disease, which is the main cause of morbidity and mortality. Next. Here's the pathophysiology cascade that we understand today, um, and starting with the abnormal mutation, which causes either reduced quantity or function of CFTR protein that leads to de defective ion transport and subsequently reduced hydration of the airway. Next slide. Um, and a reduce in the ASL level. Um, and next slide. This leads to um, um, mucus plugging and a very consistent bacterial endobronchial infection, which leads to scarring and eventual end-stage disease next. So uh, it's not surprising that for each level of this uh, pathophysiologic cascade, there have been attempts at therapeutic development um, through the TDN, I've been involved in all of these levels. But what I'm really going to focus on is really two periods in my own career, but also in CF research. And the first, next slide, um, was the focus from 1980 to, to 2000, which was before we really had a deep understanding of um, CFTR that we have today. And so the, fun, the focus was on treating the chronic lung disease, which was, as I said, the main cause of morbidity. And then uh, subsequently, next slide, um, the second focus starting from 2000 until currently has been on uh, repairing the reduced quantity or function of the uh, protein. Next slide. So when my uh, career started back in, 1980, um, chronic lung disease were the primary cause of morbidity. In fact, 90% of patients died because of chronic pseudomonas aeruginosa infections. And patients spent a half to a third of their lives uh, in the hospital um, on IV antibiotics. So this was the original focus. If you look on the left, that's a um, figure from the 2007 CF registry. And you can see back then, Pseudomonas became predominant in adolescents uh, over Staph aureus. Now that has moved out a decade. So it's really in adulthood when that transition occurs, but still a major problem. So next slide. Um, I had the honor of working with Arnie Smith, uh, who of course was at the University of Missouri as the head of microbiology for many years and then in Seattle. Um, and he um, had a very seminal observation back in the 80s that if you put um, uh, pseudomonas and sputum, it's the ideal um, culture medium, and it would take up to 25 times the MIC of tobramycin uh, to get killing uh, of pseudomonas. So next slide. So this created a significant therapeutic challenge because if you gave 25 times the MIC IV, you would have terrible nephro and ototoxicity. And so the only solution was to give the uh, aminoglycoside directly into the lung. And so for the first sort of 10 years in the 80s, uh, we worked on proof of concept that you really could get inhaled antibiotics to that high of a concentration, that it was safe and well tolerated that it killed bacteria. And we did prove that there was a thousand fold uh, killing of bacteria by that high concentration and that it would improve lung function. Next slide. Um, and finally we came to phase three uh, tobramycin trial. This was uh, published in the late nineties. Um, it's showing that if you use 30, 28 days on, 28 days off alternating therapy, that you could get about a 10 to 12 percent cha relative change in FEV1. That was the way we measured it at that time. Um, 
which was also associated with a decrease in pulmonary exacerbations. And this combination, uh, next slide, uh, led to uh, approval, uh, actually the first approval by the FDA of an inhaled antibiotic and really set the stage for all future uh, inhaled antibiotics uh, in the US. Um, this is important for a couple reasons. First of all, it was the first time the CF Foundation had worked with a small uh, startup, uh, happened to be named Pathogenesis, um, in creating their own therapies. Um, and so that set up a relationship with the FDA and the CF Foundation, and also the inspiration for the future CFF therapeutic development program and the concept of venture philanthropy, which I will um, discuss in a, in a moment. So it was very important for infrastructure. It also helped in developing FEV1 as an important clinical outcome this year. Next. Uh, I think it's important to, to stay state right here that in the end of the last century, um, actually there were significant improvements in the health of patients with CF, even though we couldn't treat the underlying defect uh, between inhaled antibiotics, Pulmazyme, which came out um, also in the 90s, um, hypertonic saline, azithromycin, uh, which isn't on here, we already were seeing significant improvement in lifespan. So I think it's important to remember you can make a difference treating the secondary consequences of a genetic disease. Uh, but we really wanted to move forward. And there were two uh, key laboratory findings that led the way uh, to the development of uh, CFDR uh, specific therapies. Next slide. The first was having to understand the basic defect. And this happened in um, the late 1980s. Um, there were two key groups. What I'm showing you here is a sweat gland. Uh, on the right is a CF sweat gland. This work was done by Paul Quentin and his group where they would micro perfuse a single sweat duct. And they found that the isotonic saline that came out, um, the resorptive portion of the, of the duct uh, was almost impermeable to anions and chloride. And this was a, a cyclic AMP dependent process. So there was the first clear um, statement that this was a, a chloride channel. Uh, Dr. Boucher and Dr. Knowles in North Carolina found similar findings in respiratory epithelium. Next slide. And the second key part of this was to understand the gene itself. And obviously in 1989, um, Francis Collin, Lapchi Choi, and Jack Reardon came out with three simultaneous articles in science uh, showing the, the CF gene and again, based on the amino acid sequence uh, that they defined was likely a chloride channel or an anion channel. And next slide. And that set off basically a revolution in, in basic science and CF led by uh, several giants like Mike Welsh, who I saw receive this award several years ago. Um, and they, these labs um, using different uh, cell lines uh, started to understand the biosynthesis, the processing and the function of CFTR. So in the normal epithelia, the nascent protein is folded, trafficked to the surface. Uh, the channel is, goes into the apical membrane, it's activated and you have either chloride or bicarbonate transport. Next slide. Um, but they found, uh, Mike Welsh with Alan Smith found that there were different mechanisms of dysfunction based on mutations. So um, you could either have lack of synthesis, we're using nonsense mutations, you could have lack of maturation, which was the most common Delta F508, um, where you had abnormal folding and trafficking. Um, or you could have abnormal regulation, such as G551D, where it got to the surface, but it could not be activated. Now, these were the more severe mutations where you had pancreatic insufficiency and shorter lifespan. Next slide. 
Um, but they were also, they found milder variants where you had abnormality and contactants through the channel itself, or you had decreased quantity because of decreased resonance time uh, in the membrane. So knowing this wide range of <clears throat> mutations, um, next slide. It became clear that if you're going to uh, fix uh, this uh, protein, that it probably wouldn't be one drug. And there would probably be two classes of drug. Uh, the first would be correctors, next slide, <clears throat> which uh, basically facilitated the processing and trafficking of CFDR to increase the amount um, at the cell surface. Um, and then the second, next slide, would be potentiating. And here, once the uh, protein has reached the surface, you have to have a small molecule that would uh, increase the open probability of the channel uh, called channel gating um, at the cell surface. So with that in mind, next slide. Uh, to do this, um, Dr. Bob Bell, who was the CEO of the foundation at that, side, at that time, realized that this was going to be, have to be an unprecedented um, program, uh, like a moonshot, um, where, um, next slide, there would have to be several components. Um, and he called it the therapeutic development program. You would have to have academic and industry groups of basic scientists looking at uh, the structure and function of the protein next. There would be high throughput screening, both academic and industry laboratories where uh, together um, they would uh, come up with potential um, uh, hits uh, or compounds. Uh, next venture philanthropy. So this was a program where the CF Foundation would de-risk the development to bring companies in because at this time there was no market in CF and so how would you get companies interested in this genetic disease and finally next was the whole concept that there needed to be a clinical trials network so that by the time uh, potential drugs became available there would be a mechanism to rapidly put them into successful clinical trials. This was the aspect of this that I was asked uh, to lead. Uh, next. So I think this was uh, a, a remarkable example of a small disease uh, taking drug discovery into their own hands. And it's now been modeled by many other foundations. So next. So, High, uh, high throughput screening is finding a needle in the haystack where you take a large number of chemical libraries um, and you look for hits next. Uh, and though for this, um, they were using a fluorescent uh, dye or fret uh, to find the lead uh, candidates and then go on to preclinical testing next. So, so the assays that, and these had to be developed from scratch uh, because uh, there were no membrane specific uh, assays. And what do you have? You were looking for a change in, in uh, chloride movement or ion uh, uh, transport. So next slide. <clears throat> so they started with um, a cell line, um, 3T3, the NIH3GC fibroblast cell line that had been transfected with Delta F that Mike Welsh had developed. And then next they would, uh, for the potentiator, they would cool them down to room temperature because uh, Dr. Welsh had already shown that it was a temperature sensitive mutation. And so you would get trafficking to the surface if in, at room temperature. So once that happened, then next they would add different compounds they thought were potentiators uh, with a dye, and then next, if it was positive, there would be um, uh, fluorescence. Uh, next, for the corrector assay, they would leave it at 37 degrees at, at a range of potential compounds uh, for 16 hours. Then they would add a potentiator. They started with genistein, but they, you know, as they got better potentiator, they would use those. And then, next slide, that um, 
if there was fluorescence again, it would light up. So that's how the assays were done with these uh, immortalized cell lines next. But following that, so using this, they got millions of potential compounds and some hits. They had to develop some secondary assays. How would they know that they had a, a pre-drug, a real drug? And there were no animal models that they could use here. I mean, they, there was the mouse model, but as you probably know, the mouse model was not ideal for the lung disease. Um, and it, the pig and the ferret and some of the other models were pretty uh, early at this time. And so they went to human primary cells, mainly human bronchial epithelial cells uh, from different mutations. And um, they did a variety. They did patch clamp to look for open probability. Um, they looked Western blots to look for um, trafficking to the surface. But one of the key ones they used was um, uh, oozing chamber assays on these HPEs, next slide, um, to where they could um, find potential candidates, uh, next. Now here, I'll show you um, three different uh, developmental levels that the, they looked at uh, for the potentiators uh, using the oozing chamber. And this was critical because this was really the marker they could use and all of us could use in vitro to determine what was going to be a viable drug. So on the left, you see the first um, um, uh, compounds to come through were actually potentiators. And there is the, uh, a class of mutations, gating mutations, of which G551D is the most common, where the protein gets to the surface, but it's not activated. And so they started by collecting HPE from patients who were heterozygous with G551D and Delta F, as that's the most common. Um, and they found a very dramatic improvement by adding the potentiator VX770, which is uh, Ivacaftor, uh, so that it returned to almost 50% of normal uh, ion transport. So that was very encouraging. Now, next slide. So next they started to tackle Delta F, Delta F. So they got homozygous uh, 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 samples from homozygous patients. And here again, you see 770, uh, had almost no effect uh, because you didn't have enough um, protein at the surface. So they had a first generation corrector, 809 or Lumicaftor. They added it and it got to about 18%. So there was, there's a response, but certainly wasn't as traumatic. So they realized that probably one corrector was not enough to stabilize the protein. So next slide. So they then, uh, went developed a, probably two to three years later um, uh, the second generation of correctors to be added to the first corrector. So you see their VX661, that's Tezicaftor, and 659 was one of the second generation candidates. And when you add that, there was a very dramatic change uh, with 57% uh, of normal transport. So with this information in mind, what was decided. Um, next slide, was that probably would be best for proof of concept moving forward to start with the unique G551D uh, gating population and go with the potentiator alone because that data on the left of the oozing chamber showed that it was strong and actually it was a few year delay till they got to the uh, other other correctors. Um, so uh, uh, what I'm not, I don't have time to really talk about today is there was a whole bunch of safety testing going on, standard uh, animal testing and so forth. And, and this product uh, had a good safety profile, uh, allowing it to go forward into human trials. And so the first human trials starting in normal controls and then going to CF in 2006. Next. Um, the, the, but making this transition, and this is, of course, in my area of research, is always a challenge. So the, in this setting, there are only 1,200 people with G551D in the, in the U.S. and a few thousand worldwide. So first was selection and identification of these patients, 
it's finding them. The next, next one, was finding the optimal biomarker be, to go from the bench to the bedside. Um, as next was to find the optimal study design, make sure we have sufficient power. And finally, next, uh, the ability to enroll and complete the studies. Next slide. So next, go. Um, was as far as genotyping the global population, this was critical for the success of all these studies. And so ever since, next slide, the gene had been discovered in, in 1989. Out of Toronto, Lapsi Choi had developed what was called CFTR1, where anybody who found a CF mutation sent it to this database in Toronto, and that had been collected, and it's uh, now Joanna Romans runs it. But in 2000, um, uh, Gary Cutting, next slide, developed a um, CFTR2 where you were, they were actually looking phenotypically whether all these mutations uh, assign disease liability, which means do these mutations, are they associated with the disease? And through this, uh, to this point, almost 90,000 people from 43 countries have been um, tested. 95% um, of all patients with a known disease have been tested. So that allowed us to know exactly where the people with G5-1D or any mutation were located. Next slide. So the next challenge was the, this bridging between laboratory findings and validated endpoints. Next. We knew from the Using Chamber work that what the dose we needed to have a change in chloride transport, next slide. But we had to get from there to what was the most common outcome that was used, which was improvement in FEV1. And this is from the in, inhaled tobramycin study, next slide. So what was going to be our link between these two next? And it was decided after a lot of meetings and so forth that probably sweat chloride would end up being the best marker. I will say that nasal potential difference was in second place. Um, next. Uh, and the reasons for this is, as you know, it'd been the gold standard for CF diagnosis for you know, since the 1950s, and it was available uh, in every care center in the world. Um, and it was a direct relation to chloride movement, um, uh, similar to the Using chamber. So it made sense. Next slide. Um, also, there had been these very extensive genotype phenotype studies, which shown the correlation between CFTR activity on the x-axis and sweat chloride value. Next slide. So you, we know that the pancreatic insufficiency had sweat chloride around 90 to 100, but the mild mutations with, with better outcomes were down around 60, which is the diagnostic level. So it was felt that if we could move from 100 down to 60, that would probably be a or 20% function that would be a game changer. So that was the goal. Next slide. So we had, we felt met, met the challenge and we could go ahead with the clinical trials. We'd identified the patients. We chosen sweat chloride as our um, biomarker for the phase two trials. Although we did do nasal PD in the background. Um, and we felt that 50 patients would be adequate to show this uh, uh, delta of about 40 uh, millimolar per liter. And we had identified and would be able to enroll the patients next. So here was the phase two trial, came out in 2010 in the New England Journal. I wanna give credit to Frank Accurso, uh, who really led the, the effort to have sweat chloride be the biomarker. And you can see here, this is just beautiful data where you have a clear dose response going from 25 to 150 milligrams. The sweat chloride drops down to 46 uh, millimolar drops. There's a delta of uh, 46 millimolar per liter. Next slide. And this was then verified in the phase three trial, which I had the honor of, of leading. 
um, where there was again almost a 50 millimolar drop and it was stayed down there for 48 weeks. Next slide. And this was closely related, next slide, to the um, um, change in FEV1. You see here, this is a percent, uh, percent predicted FEV1 change, not relative change. Um, it was 10 and again, did not waver for 48 weeks. Next. So this was a game changer. This uh, resulted in approval of Ivacaftor uh, as a therapy uh, in uh, 2012. Um, there was great excitement about it, but ultimately if you take all the gating mutations plus um, other mild mutations like R117, that's about 12 to 14% of the population. That leaves the vast majority without treatment. Next slide. So the next uh, uh, push was to bring in the um, corrector, the first generation of correctors. There were two of them, Lumicaptor and Tezacaptor. They were basically the same, except Lumicaptor had significant drug-drug interactions, which is why they brought in Tezacaptor. And um, this was effective, I'll, I'll show you in a second, not as effective as Ivacaptor, but only if you had two copies of Delta F508. So that added another 47% of the population. Um, but clearly there needed to be more. So uh, next slide. So then the second generation corrector, which was uh, Alexacaftor with Tezacaftor and Ivacaftor, so triple therapy, made it possible to treat not only two copies of Delta F, but only one, so heterozygotes, of which there are actually a large population, and um, homozygous. So now you are up to 93% of the population, uh, which is uh, was a dramatic change. Next slide. But the issue was that what is going to be your um, your bar, uh, the initial milestones that you wanted to meet, and Ivacaptor in the initial uh, studies of G551D really set the bar with a at least a 40 millimolar uh, per liter drop in sweat chloride and a 10% increase in FEV1. Next slide. Unfortunately, the first generation correctors weren't there. Uh, the sweat chloride drop was maybe five to at max 10. Uh, millimolar per liter, and the increase in FDV1 was around two to three percent. So just squeaked over the bar. Um, so then when the, the triple combination came, next slide, uh, once again, you're seeing a remarkable, highly effective impact where you have a dramatic drop in sweat chloride. And now the FDV1 change was up around uh, 12 to 13 percent. Um, plus, it was covering a very large percentage of the population. Next. So the question is, we had shown the proof that you could get down from 100 millimoles, if you're the pancreatic insufficient group, down to 60. Could you, uh, next slide, could you actually go beyond that? Were we now able to get down almost to carrier level, which we know carriers have normal lifespan, uh, um, which would be less than about 30 millimole per liter. Um, next slide. And this just came out last week in the Blue Journal um, online. Um, and it's really, really, I think, fascinating. So this is the study of triple therapy in patients with both one and two copies of Delta F ages six to 12. So right now, um, ETI triple therapy is approved for 12 and above. It's approved worldwide, but not in children. A very similar situation to the coronavirus right now. But this study was published for the, the six to 12 year olds. And I want you to look at this uh, closely. So on the right side, you'll see patients who had two copies of Delta F and the gray bar shows the patients who got below uh, 60 millimolar per liter, the blue bar is below 30 
millimolar per liter. So you can see that 43% of, the, of those children were down at quote near the carrier range. If you only have one copy, that's very rare, but you do get below 60. So it does look like it's possible to drop it that low. Next slide. Uh, this is study where it's been accepted for uh, publication, but hasn't been released yet. So these are just preliminary data. And this is the patients that originally I showed you, the G551D, so the gating mutations plus patients with residual function, uh, which were the milder variant, where they, were res they are responsive to Ivacaptor, they have been on Ivacaptor, uh, but then they were uh, switched to triple therapy to see if you could get increased effect. Uh, uh, next slide. And fascinating, even though we, I showed you before, there was a negative 46 millimolar per liter with IVA alone. Now adding triple therapy, you go down yet another 22 millimolar per liter, which brings you down to about the 30, millim 30 millimolar per liter range. Uh, similar to what you saw in the younger children. So I think this will become the new uh, bar. Uh, there also was some increased improvement in FEV1. Um, uh, so anyway, this will be out soon. Next. So, well, we've showed these numbers, but how does this really impact patients' lives? And, and to me, this is what's been most striking. This is a picture of me in 2012 with a Patient, my very first patient when I started my practice in 1980 was Rick. Um, and he'd gone on to the adult center and I'd lost contact with him actually for decades. But he was a study junkie. He'd been in Pulmazyme, he'd been in my Toby studies and he got in the Iva Kafter studies. Um, and he came by to tell me that this had transformed his life, that he had gone from literally being home on oxygen to being back working full time with as a, as a uh, teacher and, uh, you know, playing soccer with these kids. And I think anybody who's taking care of adults with CF, this is just uh, so remarkable to see this difference. Next slide. And it's shown here in the phase three studies of triple therapy in patients greater than 12. This measure shows you, uh, it's a quality of life measure used in multiple studies. It's called the uh, CFRD uh, respiratory uh, domain. And it was set up originally for inhaled antibiotic therapies. Uh, and it was determined that the minimal clinically important difference or MCID was a change of four points, which you see on the vertical axis. But if you look here at both patients with two or one, um, uh, Delta F, uh, there is a change of 18, almost close to 20. That is four times the MCID. Um, and basically the symptoms was, you know, this is things like cough, sputum production, you know, wheezing, et cetera. The symptoms are leaving uh, next. <coughs> and here, uh, next, uh, one more, thank you. I really want you to look, this is just amazing. So this shows you uh, in the, the, a slide of the transplant rate for patients with CF. Um, now, 1920, uh, 20, excuse me, 2020 was a remarkable year. We know there was a pandemic and that could clearly have impacted uh, transplants. But across the country, uh, adult partners of mine have told me that they are taking their patients off the transplant list because they've started ETI and basically their lung functions have improved so that they come off. Now, if you ever look at a CT scan or a chest X-ray of someone with end-stage um, CF, you wouldn't think that that was reversible disease. So I think it makes us think about uh, what is reversible. And to me, this is absolutely amazing that even with end stage disease, they are having reversibility. We'll have to just see how this trend continues. Uh, next. So I think one interesting thing is these 
modulators are a very important tool for future study to understand the disease manifestations. And so one of the things that the CF Foundation and many of the European foundations have done, next slide, is develop these post-approval studies where you get baseline data just before they start the, uh, an FDA-approved therapy and then follow them for three to five years afterwards. And it started with the GOAL study, which was after Ivacaftor was approved in 2012, and it's been going on, it went on for six to seven years. Next um, is the uh, PROSPECT study, which was uh, following patients who got on Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor uh, from 15 to 18. Next, the CHECK study, which is looking at all of these um, uh, post-approval studies specifically focusing on sweat chloride and the changes in sweat chloride so we understand numerically what, what levels are significant changes. Next, uh, and now PROMISE is a, a very large study after triple therapy has started, started in 2019 and is still ongoing for patients with at least one copy of Delta F508, 12 years now it's gone down to six years and older. And finally, BEGIN, uh, which um, actually is something I'm uh, a part of, uh, which is really exciting. It's the babies from zero to six. Uh, they will be hopefully getting on triple therapy in the next two years. And so we're doing a pre and post study. Next slide, uh, there's just been tons of data that's come out of these uh, post-approval studies. These are just some examples from PROMISE. This was from the first uh, three to six months post um, um, initiation. And you can see on the left, these are lung clearance studies done in uh, North Carolina and Pittsburgh, where you can see the gray line is pre-therapy uh, and, and the blue line is post. And at each time point, there's like a 50% increase in airway, in mucus clearance, which is pretty remarkable. And on the right, you see changes in the percent solids of the sputum where it actually markedly decreases. Why? Because you get increased hydration. So it shows that you actually are changing um, sputum or airway secretions, physical properties next. The big question everyone asks is what's gonna to happen to the microbiology? Because really most of these studies have not focused on microbiology because these aren't antibiotics. Um, but now we're really looking at how is it changing infection? And this shows the first three months of people on uh, triple therapy. The blue is people converting to negative to Pseudomonas, orange is uh, maintaining it gray is new. If you look at the waterfall in the middle, you'll see that about a third, and again, that's shown on the right, about a third of patients have converted to negative, which if you've cared for adult patients with CF, that doesn't happen very often. So that's encouraging. We're just going to have to follow it and see, does it stay uh, negative or does it come back? Um, so this will be an important question to follow over time. Next. So what are the next steps now? Um, well, obviously we want to get it down to infants and children as a pediatrician, and that's important to me. Um, and then the other is expanding it. How many more patients can we expand it to? Uh, should it be given to post-transplant patients? I mean, clearly their lungs are different, but these therapies have remarkable impact on the GI tract and pancreas in infants may have impact on the pancreas. Um, and also, what about therotyping rare mutations to see if they're responsive? Are there other modulators in the pipeline? And what about the 10% of patients who are non-responsive? Next. So this is the same slide I showed you, the sweat chloride value. This just came out in the Blue Journal. There was also a remarkable improvement in FGV1, even though these were very healthy kids. So we're very confident that these data uh, will um, eventually lead to FDA approval so that this can get down to six years of age sometime in the near future. I have no idea uh, when that will happen. Um, there are 
studies looking down all the way to six months of age um, in the future next. This is just to let you know that, um, you know, I, all of these uh, programs have been with a single company and it would obviously be nice to have multiple um, therapeutic approaches um, beyond ETI. Um, ETI is relatively safe, but no triple therapy is going to be without some safety concerns like elevated liver enzymes and drug-drug interactions. So, um, for example, this happens to be AbbVie is developing both correctors and potentiators. So there are other uh, potential therapies uh, in, um, in the market space. Next. Uh, the other really important program is the CF Foundation is determined to develop therapies for the remaining 10% of patients. Um, and they have developed a $500 million program to go back to gene therapies. The gene therapies were tried to be developed in the 90s and was not successful. A uh, new paragraph, a new um, slide, please. Thank you. Um, so far, they funded 39 programs with both academic and industry partners. Um, looking at CFDR restorations, there's 14 programs. That's looking a lot at nonsense mutations and mRNA or oligonucleotides. Gene delivery, going back to both viral and non-viral gene editing, um, and also a stem cell um, consortium. So if you're interested in any of these areas, there is a lot of potential to get involved uh, at this time. Next, so I would just like to end by saying the lessons we've learned about successful drug development is the power of industry, academia, uh, foundations, and the federal government, the NIH and the FDA working together. It took uh, a whole team uh, to make this happen. Next, so I would just like to Thank the patients and families, uh, the caregivers and researchers, and the CF Foundation. Uh, Jennifer Taylor Kauser and JP Clancy were kind enough to help me with some of the slides. Uh, thank you. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramsey. Uh, Dr. Holtzman, you can go ahead and proceed with the Q&A session. Oh, nice. So I guess that means I get to ask the first question. <laughs> yes, I guess so, yes. So I'm gonna take the opportunity by, so so, um, so I guess I, this may not be a completely fair question, but I wanted to get your input nonetheless. It, and the question really is, is there any role for immunology in this puzzle? So yeah, I know Mike's group and uh, Rick's group and others uh, argue that you know infection occurs very early it's easy to understand why abnormal nucleociliary clearance would cause problems with bacterial infection. But you know, a lot of the damage um, from infection is due to the host immune response, right. not so much. And that's where I, you know, so that's where we come in. Yeah. And we have some, already some signs of that in the phenotyping uh, for the antiviral response in CF. So I just wondered, you know, outside, I mean, I love epithelial cells as you like to know. <laughs> But I, I just wondered, is there any, what's your perspective on sort of the non, I wouldn't call it non-CFTR, but the immunology behind the progression of disease? Oh, I think as, you, as you're well aware, it's a remarkably, uh, I always uh, sort of compared the CF lung to Chernobyl uh, in that it's just a remarkably robust neutrophilic uh, response. And it was also very interesting when the um, when the modulators, you know, we first started studying them. I mean, to be honest with you, I didn't have time to go into these post uh, approval studies, but we are spending a lot of time looking at the change in immune response and infection because those things just weren't looked at during the modulator studies. Um, and it was fascinating because there, you would have thought that there would have been, you know, whether you get eradication of the bugs and, and the inflammatory response would come down immediately. 
And it really didn't. In fact, uh, the initial immune response hardly moved at all. Now, the question was, because you've already got structural uh, defects and you really, again, like Chernobyl, once you get it started, maybe you just can't really turn it off. Um, so is it that you have a chronic infection and you have basically young, healthy people who can just make intense uh, immune response or is there an innate uh, immune problem? I will say what's a little more encouraging to me is with uh, Promise, with the triple therapy, they are starting to see some decreases, both in neutrophils, IL-8, lots of other cytokines. It's starting to calm down a little bit. And I really think we're going to have to look. That's why this is the whole reason I am doing the working on the BEGIN study, because I think we've got to see in the zero to six. If you can get in there before this all starts, that's when you'll really see what is the innate abnormality and what is just a system that was turned on that you can't get turned off. Does that make sense? So yes, I think from your standpoint, there are, uh, you know, we're collecting, uh, you know, blood. Uh, we and we're actually doing BAL studies down to like three year olds. So yeah, I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Now I won't, I won't monopolize the time here, but I, that, yeah. that on that point, I think um, the Iowa data with very early, early uh, yes. sampling in the pig model was really interesting. Along fabulous, so, absolutely fabulous. All right, so I better not. So uh, I, did you want, Ava, did you want me to look at the chat and just bring in people? Yeah, you can go ahead. I see that um, we have some questions there. If you'd like to go through those. So Bonnie, so for, also that was an, a fantastic talk. I should have said that. Thank you. Um, um, so here's the first question. Are there any contraindications to using uh, ibuprofen or ETI in these patients? So they're looking for contraindications. Sorry. Oh, contraindications. Yeah. I, I, what I do apologize, I realize I really didn't have time to go through the whole safety development, the safety issues, and obviously that is critical. Um, the main um, concerns have been um, some tweaking of liver functions. Uh, and it's hard to judge in CF patients because their liver functions go up and down. So if, if patients have significant liver disease, that would be a, a contraindication. Um, although we certainly haven't seen like, uh, you know, aggressive liver failure or anything like that. Uh, the other, there was a big concern about uh, cataracts because uh, that was seen in the animal studies and that's been followed very closely and hasn't really been a significant problem. Um, it wasn't originally studied in the very severely ill. And so there was concern that all of a sudden, if you started mobilizing these secretions, you'd get, you know, you'd get into big trouble, trouble and uh, they drowned. Uh, but um, as you've seen, actually, they've done very well. Uh, so now they don't have an FEV1 uh, basement. You can put it, give it to anybody, no matter the severity. It's not been tested much in post-transplant. Obviously, you've got a lot of other drugs there that will be interacting. Uh, so those would be uh, the main things. And then this, I guess this probably is our last question here. So, oh, well, maybe two more. So we have two, yeah. two guys, two self-interested questions I can see here. <laughs> so one's from Haresh who's asking, <laughs> you'll understand my comment there. Are there any samples uh, available? So he's looking for airway and sputum samples as part of the modulator study so people can look at a dysregulated immune signature. Um, well, that's a fabulous question because it's great news. So the CF Foundation has, uh, as part of the, all these post-approval studies, uh, they have uh, developed a pretty robust bio repository um, and you can, anybody can apply uh, for, um, you know, you can also go to um, individual sites and like come to the UW and ask for their own, but the CF Foundation does have this bio repository and they very much want people to use it. It's actually underutilized. So um, if this person, they can contact me if they want to know who to contact at the foundation. Very good. And then Jeff Atkinson has the other question. You might know Jeff. He's a, one of our CF guys. And he's asking, is there potential to combine uh, read-through drugs with ETI to make quad therapy uh, for stop mutations? 
more sophisticated. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, again, you'd have to just see if there's drug interactions. I, they are, that will likely be necessary um, because just because you get, re what we don't know, if you get read through, you get a totally normal protein and therefore you don't have to do anything else to it. Or is it like, Delta F, where Delta F, it has a trafficking problem, but it also has an activation problem. So that's why you need multiple therapies. So I don't think there's any inherent reason uh, why, uh, unless there were drug drug interactions, why you couldn't consider that. So I think we're okay. That uh, That's all I see in the chat room. And I, I just wanna, from my end, just thank you again for taking time to do this it's, yeah I love i'm so sorry we've been this. trying for two years so that i could come <laughs> yeah. to st louis but that's right so the first you so you're the first we'll put you on the uh whatever the honor roll for two years how's that uh, okay okay you can put it twice in your thank seat thank you this was this was fun and i'm sorry about the technical issue and i want to thank uh, the chief resident for being kind enough to to uh to push the button for me yeah Yes, thanks, Ava. Great job. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you, both of you, for being here this morning. Yeah. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen so people can get credit um, for being at conference this morning. Um, and thank you again. All right.